Good afternoon, everyone. I am, my name is Carolyn Jubay. I'm the Executive Director at Fertility Matters Canada. I want to welcome you all to our F Figuring Out Fertility Facebook Live series this afternoon. I'm thrilled um, to be having this session today um, with Dr. Talon from All of Fertility in Vancouver. Uh, this is our first time meeting face to face, so I'm thrilled to have you here. Um, and how today's session is going to work. We're live on Zoom, we're live on Facebook. Dr. Talon is going, she's got some information she wants to present to us. So please feel free at any time to ask questions, uh, either in the Zoom chat box or in Facebook, and we will get to those questions um, as we move through the presentation. So Dr. Talon, thank you for being here, and I'm going to take myself, um, put myself on mute and leave it to you for a few minutes. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to do this. I love uh, educating and passing information along to our patients. So this is a great opportunity given um, our new virtual format moving forward. Um, so the title today is an introduction to IVF. And I just wanted to put that into context of uh, fertility, the evaluation when we see patients referred. And then we're gonna talk about IVF in great detail. Um, usually when we see a couple for discussion around IVF, it can take anywhere between 30 and 40 minutes to really fully cancel on the nitty gritty components. And we don't really have time. I'd like to do question and answer afterwards. So it is going to be kind of an overview of the process um, in, in big terms. So um, if you look at like what is infertility, um, it's where a couple try to conceive on their own at home for about a year, usually 12 months. And after 12 months of failed attempts, that really defines their odds of pregnancy moving forward. Um, it also refers to, say, for example, a single woman being exposed to sperm uh, at insemination or um, any other couples that we may see from the LGBTQ community that are trying to conceive um, with insemination. And we're looking at really if you haven't had a successful pregnancy um, over a reasonable period of time, that's when we consider that you need some kind of an intervention to increase your odds of pregnancy. So um, the overall incidence of infertility is about 10 to 15 percent, but obviously it's much more prevalent at older age. So women over the age of 40, we're looking at rates of infertility of like over 60 percent. So if you look at how long it actually takes most people to conceive, so where you have exposure to sperm um, and egg at, a re at the right time have the opportunity to meet, you'll see that most people conceive somewhere like six to eight months. Um, and 85% of couples over a year. And in the next year, some people will still have some success in achieving a pregnancy, but the number is about 7% beyond the year. So not a, a huge increase in really pushing it that long. But if we do see someone that says, you know, I've been trying for a pregnancy for a number of years, that's usually an indication that IVF is required for conception. Um, and in the big picture, when we look at when we want to have patients referred to us, um, age does play a piece in there. And so we are willing to give younger couples more time to try on their own at home. Whereas, you know, over 35 to, to 40, we want to see patients for an evaluation if they've been uh, trying for six months without success. And really over 40, we want to see patients right away so we can start the process of evaluating, which can take some time as well. And the Dr. Talon, yeah. sorry, I just had a question. Um, yeah. Sometimes we see this in our support groups um, or when I'm talking to individuals, um, if someone has a diagnosed issue with a reproductive system, so what, should they be waiting six months to a year? No, that's an excellent question. I was just going to come to address okay. that. So um, imminent or immediate referral makes sense. So um, the most obvious would be you're a single woman and you need sperm. You should mm -hmm. come right away. Or um, if you are very certain that you have irregular menstrual cycles and you've been uh, seen for that in the past, or you cannot interpret what's happening with an ovulation cycle or your menstrual cycle, why waste time trying to work that out? Usually that is a flag that you need some assistance. 
And usually that's with low tech treatments like fertility pills and they're very uh, successful. Um, but again, we want to see those patients younger um, and not have them waste time dealing with issues that put them at a poorer prognosis and wasting time with age. Um, other examples would be for, uh, if you've had chlamydia, there's a great chance that you would have blocked tubes or if you know that uh, there's an issue with sperm um, and a low sperm count, again, there are reasons to be seen right away. Great, thank you for that. Yeah, not at all. Um, so in terms of evaluation, we want to determine, uh, is there something obvious that we can fix? So um, in the context of, say, a, a woman who is single and interested in, say, fertility preservation, like looking at egg freezing, because uh, fertility is important to her and she doesn't have a partner, they'll often ask, um, are my tests normal? And I think it's really important to define that tests don't tell you whether or not you have fertility. They tell you whether or not you have the pieces to achieve a pregnancy. Uh, but fertility is really when you try and you don't have success on your own, that would be infertility, or when you try and you do have success, it's fertility. And again, defined in reasonable time frames, and we set that for younger women at a year. The, Evaluation is looking at tubes. Do we have tubes to allow sperm and egg to meet through? Is the uterus normal and a normal shape to allow implantation to occur? Is there sperm that's reasonably getting to an egg? And is the egg reserve reasonable? And the quality of eggs is really deemed by a woman's age. So we put all of that together. We determine from our history, is she ovulating? Are they timing things correctly? And then we are able to best say, look, what's the best approach for you to move forward with a treatment? And there are certain pieces where we would say uh, are red flags and we're concerned for patients to take time with, say, a low-tech fertility treatment like insemination, or um, if they were to do something using fertility pills and maybe they're of advanced age and their goal is for a bigger family size, we may be looking at pushing into something aggressive like IVF sooner than later. So that brings us really to our topic, which is, you know, IVF in vitro fertilization is um, the best fertility treatment that we have at achieving the quickest time to conception. And it is, um, it, and definitely our technology has changed over the years to bring us to a point where we really see excellent success rates. But we also have to temper that with the known limitations of treatment, which are really uh, the number of eggs that we have to, to work with from a woman and the age of, again, uh, those eggs. And that's just to give patients counseling or set their expectations as to what treatment like IVF would bring them for success. Right. Um, so it's really to set the stage for what they're um, expecting from treatment. Now, in terms of um, indications for IVF, I've kind of addressed it briefly, but to be clearer, so someone who has failed low-tech fertility treatments like fertility pills and insemination or injection drugs and insemination um, would be looking at IVF as the next step. Or maybe it's a primary treatment upfront for someone with quite significant advanced age or for someone uh, where the sperm that they're using is a very, very low number and is unlikely in the natural system to fertilize an egg. And we literally have to put a sperm into a single egg, and that would happen at IVF. Um, or if there are red flags from testing, let's say this woman has a significantly low egg reserve, we're worried about her wasting time with lower tech treatments that carry a lower odds of success. Um, other scenarios, like IVF really began uh, as a way to overcome the barrier of uh, block tubes, where a sperm and egg would never be able to meet in the natural system. And so that brings us to like this idea that we are able to harvest eggs from a woman. And I'm gonna walk through the steps of IVF, but the aim is to get eggs from an egg harvest or retrieval, and then have the opportunity in the lab to have sperm and egg meet in close proximity to optimize fertilization. And we'll talk about standard IVF and ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection for fertilization. And then you give time for embryos to grow in the lab. And then hopefully the end game is to transfer those embryos into a uterus for pregnancy. 
So in terms of the steps for IVF, um, not every clinic would do this exactly the same way. Again, it's individualized to patients, but there could be a priming phase that is usually the month prior to starting injections where we're using either estrogen pills or the birth control pill to try to optimize the way in which eggs would stimulate or grow in the months where you're taking injection drugs. So at a core, IVF's goal is to get as many eggs safely in a short period of time. And I often will highlight to patients that in a natural cycle, a woman will ovulate one egg on her own. And that one egg obviously carries a big responsibility in that month and you hope it's genetically viable and that it's capable of fertilizing with the sperm to bring about a genetically normal embryo for use. But as we get older, our egg reserve decreases and the likelihood that those eggs are genetically abnormal or non-viable increases. So what you see is, and this is a bit of a myth, we're actually not able to make a, or determine exactly the number of eggs that every woman will get to be the same. A woman's egg reserve is set inherently um, by her own body. And uh, you're looking at trying to get the maximum number of eggs, her egg number to grow in that like 10 to 12 days of, in, of treatment to get to the egg retrieval. So from priming, which is usually a few days to maybe two weeks, a woman will have a period, and then we schedule their injection drugs that they would take. And those drugs are gonadotropins or mimic the hormonal signals that come from the brain to signal to the ovary normally to make an egg grow. But we override that to get many eggs to grow. Again, the maximum number would be set by her body. And then um, we do monitoring to determine how they're growing. And so some women grow eggs fast, some women grow them slow. And the monitoring is to deem where is the sweet spot where we're gonna get the most mature eggs after an egg retrieval. And so at usually an ultrasound, that's part of monitoring and blood work, looking at hormonal responses, then we're able to determine when is the right time for the egg harvest. And so there's a bit of a window that we give um, people to say, this is where we guesstimate that you're gonna have an egg retrieval, but you never really know until you're two days out from having your egg retrieval. The commonest side effect would be uh, fatigue, uh, sometimes some um, headache symptoms, some bloating, which are usually tends to be mild, but most women will work through priming and through that stimulation phase where they're doing injections. And all of that is taking place at home. So injections in the morning and at night and normal life in between. And the monitoring visits are usually scattered in there somewhere between three and four visits, maybe over the course of those two weeks. Um, and then we plan for an egg retrieval. And I would say um, most patients worry about the egg retrieval most because it looks invasive, um, but it really is uh, it's like a 15, 20 minute procedure at most where you have medication that either makes you feel calm or helps with pain. And you are usually alert and watching what is happening around you. And it, it is an interesting process whereby through the vagina, we place an ultrasound probe, which has a needle guide and it's really right into the ovary and we suck the fluid from the sacs that contain the, um, the egg within, and there's one egg from every sac. And we do that until the ovaries have been aspirated completely, and that fluid goes into the laboratory where they look under a microscope and they pick out the eggs that then will be ready for fertilization. And Dr. Usually, Talon, when yeah. this happens, so when you're um, doing the egg retrieval, and is how many eggs do you, can you take out at one time, um, like in a single suction, I guess? Um, and then at your clinic, or is it at all clinics, um, you know, is the embryologist right with you and takes the eggs immediately to the, to the lab? I, I was curious about that piece of it. I mean, okay, so, I know I'm a patient and I've had two um, yeah. IVF treatments. So, but for our viewers, I'd love to touch on that just a bit. A description. Okay. So, um, 
I, I think a, a good piece to start with with this to address how many eggs we're taking. Some women really feel that we're stealing eggs at IVF treatment and that means that in the future they're going to run out of them and maybe go into menopause earlier and that again is a bit of a myth. So every month a woman has a collection of follicles, again these sacs that each contain an egg scattered within the ovaries. And the hormonal signaling in the body sets up so one is released, but the rest in the background that month die. Okay, so there's this constant turnover of a group of eggs, and usually naturally we're using one. The, again, success at IVF is trying to get all of the, those eggs that month to grow. We have no way of touching eggs in the background for the next month or the month after. Um, so the aim of an egg retrieval is to suck everything that is available that has grown that month, right? And leave nothing right. behind. Because really in there lies the success. Is, it is a numbers game. And um, in terms of the setup, um, some clinic, clinics would be different. At our facility, the egg retrieval or procedure room is linked with the laboratory through a window and also through a door. And our nurses take the tubes and carry them to a heating tray through a window where the embryologist on the other side can take those tubes and work separately in a different room. Now, in other clinics, it will be different. The embryologist may actually come into the room and take the tubes themselves into the laboratory. So um, it, it's usually something that is tweaked for the environment that you're in and what works best. And usually the patient has a nurse with them who's monitoring them because they've had medications and, um, and is taking care of them. And sometimes we need to give more medications and address things as we go. But again, it's a very quick procedure. So it tends to be over pretty fast. Um, did that address your question? Yeah, that was, yeah? That was okay. great. And then I guess just in addition to that, mm -hmm. as you're doing, as you're in the retrieval, when you, um, I don't know the proper terminology, I apologize. When one egg is taken from the ovary into the two, are more than one taken at a time or does it some does it depend? Is it always just one egg per two? Not usually. Um, so there is a needle and attached to the needle is suction tubing. Um, and on the end of that suction tubing is the tube. And usually the doctor has a needle and is going into each of those sacs and just uh, consecutively just sucking fluid out. And we know that not every single sac that we drain is going to give us an egg. And we know that not every egg is going to be mature. And we know that not every mature egg fertilizes and not every fertilized um, a zygote or early embryo is going to continue to grow into an embryo that's going to be suitable for using. So, and it's important to lay that out for patients because the next week from the point of an egg retrieval on can be quite daunting, especially if you're starting with a lower number and you see it dwindle down each day to finally maybe just one embryo at the end and you're thinking, wow, like, you know, I've gone through so much and I just have one embryo. But again, you have, to, you have to remember, this is the quickest way to get pregnant. And I hear this from patients over and over again, IVF didn't work for me. And I say, you need to tell me what didn't work for you. Because we know there are limitations to treatment. And if you understand the limitations, usually that allows you the capability of continuing to try. It's when you don't understand where, you know, you don't see success that you may stop or stumble and find that it's too much to continue with. So I want to highlight that is, you know, when we get, say, 10 follicles growing on ultrasound, we say you're ready for egg retrieval, we do a harvest, maybe you get seven or eight eggs. We put sperm and egg together and you see fertilization rates of 70%. And then a third of embryos grow. And that, these are big, broad numbers I'm giving you. Obviously, they are adjusted based on age and um, averages. Um, but maybe from 10 eggs, you end up with two or three embryos at the end. Well, your age then is going to set the likelihood that those embryos are genetically useful or viable. And we don't usually recommend genetic testing of embryos for women under 38, because from an odds perspective, each embryo has a high probability of bringing a normal pregnancy. So if you're under 35, the odds of that embryo has 46 chromosomes, like half from mom, half from dad, or sperm and egg, whether they're donors or not, you would be looking at 
the age of the egg dictating the likelihood that that will bring an embryo that's useful. And so that at under 35 is 60%. And then you see between 35 and 38 that go down to, oh, sorry, it's 60% under 35 and between 35 and 38, um, 50. And over 38 to 40, it's 35%. And this is where you see, this is age, the age's effect on fertility. And if you can understand that you're making eggs maybe 10 from an IVF cycle, that's like trying for 10 months on your own, one, one egg a month. You're yeah. just, and if you don't have success from um, those 10 eggs, it's like, look, you, you just didn't find one that worked in there. You just need more. And you, we do see that with patients that with more cumulative cycles and more eggs and more embryos to use, that ultimately success rates go up and up. Um, which is uh, very reassuring for patients. But I really feel if there were one thing that changed my practice in the last five years, it would be genetic testing of embryos. And that is, there's a lot that goes into understanding that piece of IVF. Mm -hmm. But for women um, or couples over 38 that are using eggs from, um, you know, at the age of over 38, you're really looking at uh, understanding that the odds are against you. Like it's a 65% odds that those embryos would be abnormal. And if you're able to genetically test, it's not that genetic testing makes your embryos normal, but it will disclose whether or not you have an embryo that is, and I should use it's normal, as in as best as we can test for, has 46 chromosomes. Um, but it's as close as you can get to controlling for the reasons why embryos don't stick. And if you recognize that not every embryo is normal, you put it into the uterus, you're leaving that to nature to determine whether or not that embryo is of uh, good quality. And if it sticks, it means it's capable of sticking. And if it miscarries, it, that is most of the time nature's way of eliminating a, a very significant form of genetic abnormality. And if it continues to grow a pregnancy to 12 or 14 weeks and you do genetic testing in pregnancy, you may find a small percentage of those pregnancies affected with things um, like what we call aneuploidy or chromosomal imbalances. And the most common or commonly aware of is uh, Down syndrome. Um, and and there, really, you can identify those things up front um, with ge pre-implantation genetic testing of embryos. So that would happen a week or so after an egg retrieval. So when we get to embryo development, we are looking for development to what we call a blastocyst. And a blastocyst is an embryo that has developed into different cell lines. And the outer cells are trophic ectoderm or cells that lead to the placenta. And that's what can be biopsied at pre-implantation genetic testing. Um, or a patient may opt to use a blastocyst fresh and have a fresh transfer, just replace that right into the uterus at that time. Or they may opt to freeze embryos without testing for future use. Okay, so when we look at freezing um, for IVF, there's a few indications whereby we may actually recommend freezing. So an example would be where a, a woman has a very brisk response to IVF medications and she's had more than 15 eggs grow and she has a high level of estrogen as a consequence because estrogen is secreted from each egg that is growing. And we know that if you have more than 15 eggs, you are more likely to be uncomfortable in that moment. But when you get pregnant, the pregnancy hormone precipitates changes that can bring about a syndrome called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome that can be quite uncomfortable where women become dehydrated. They um, often have fluid fill up their belly. Um, now, luckily, this is not very common. It occurs in a severe form in less than 1% of cases. And really, medicine today allows us moderate that quite a bit in that uh, we can use certain medications to decrease the risk of this um, syndrome as a consequence of IVF. And we're also able to freeze embryos and defer the actual act of pregnancy until a time where those hormones have gone down or tempered to their normal values. 
Um, and so IVF is actually safer today than it has ever been before. So that would be the prime reason to do freezing of embryos. And the second reason would be to, when you genetically test an embryo and you take a biopsy, you need to freeze that embryo while you wait for the results to come back from the biopsy. And usually that can take one to two weeks. Um, another indication for freezing would be um, if you have a, a couple that are looking at fertility preservation, like their goal is actually not to get pregnant. They want to use this at a later point in time. Or a patient who is a cancer patient who's looking at maybe chemotherapy or radiation um, in the upcoming weeks, and they're looking at safeguarding sperm or eggs for um, uh, later use. Um, and fertility preservation using embryo freezing is good if they have a committed partner that they can commit their eggs to and sperm to. Um, in terms of, does, is that pretty clear, Carol, in there? Is there anything you yeah, want to go into? Actually, well, I, that's, it's really great. Um, we do see in a lot of, and you know what, we see some clinics, um, we hear in, in some of our support groups, patients are quite often have questions about, um, you know, some clinics are moving toward a freeze-all model. So yeah. you do your IVF, we create the embryos, we get them to the three or five, and then everything is frozen. And of yeah. course, with COVID, we've seen that for sure. Um, I'm just curious to know, is that something that a lot of clinics are moving towards? And what is statistically an FET, a frozen embryo transfer versus a fresh transfer? What do those look like? Is one statistically more successful than the other? Yeah, it's such a good question. And so, and it's skewed. So you really need to break it down. So is our most clinics moving to a freeze all? I, I think that's really variable. I don't want to speak on behalf of all clinics mm -hmm. in Canada. I think at our clinic, um, it really depends on the clinical situation. So most of our, our IVF cycles, I'd say about 60% do do genetic testing of embryos. That's the population that we're seeing. And that requires you to freeze your embryos. Right. Um, now, in the, there's other medical scenarios, like again, polycystic ovarian syndrome, where we're looking at getting a large yield of eggs. There's no question that there is evidence that suggests a frozen embryo transfer has a higher chance of pregnancy than the fresh version where you have a high estrogen level due to the high number of eggs that are growing and being retrieved in that time. The difference is between 10 and 15%, depending on where you read. So it's significant, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, so and do you mean ver, um, in the favor of 15% higher for frozen? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we would recommend freezing if you have an excess of eggs and you look like you're going to be at risk of ovarian hyperstimulation anyways with a, tra a fresh transfer, but also it carries um, higher odds of pregnancy with that one embryo that you would transfer. And you have to remember the embryo that you transfer in your fresh cycle is always the best embryo in that it has made it to where it needs to be first. So you want to give that the optimum environment to have success with. And so that makes sense and you're frozen in that scenario. And some patients will never make it to a blast stage, meaning they maybe have a low number of eggs, they have um, maybe never had anything other than a day three embryo, not a day five or six blastocyst. And uh, they question, you know, what's the point of me trying to grow to the point of a blastocyst to freeze if I never make it there? And you can't really test that uh, theory as to whether or not a day three or a blastocyst embryo is better because every embryo is different. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'd need to be testing the same, same embryos to work that out. But in it, what it looks like is there's no harm with doing a day three embryo transfer. And we tend to put back more embryos on day three because really we don't know how to select them, which are the best ones from the rest on day three. They all look kind of the same. So we right. tend to put back more to have a higher chance of pregnancy, whereas when you grow them for longer in the lab, they self-declare which one's better by making it further along. So if they make it to a blastocyst, well, that embryo was better on day three than the others, but we wouldn't have known that up front. Of course. So when you look at numbers overall, frozen embryo transfer success rates are higher. Yes. And there's, you know, that's because those embryos are genetically tested. You're only ever putting back 
genetically normal embryos um, after genetic testing, so you're not including genetically abnormal embryos. So you have to separate those out. That's a separate group. And they always statistically have the highest odds of success of about 70 or 75% and highly efficient embryo transfers from genetically screened embryos. But if you look at everyone else separately, again, if you look at a single embryo transfer from a younger woman who was at risk of OHSS and did a frozen transfer, it does look like she has a higher chance of pregnancy from a frozen than a fresh. Okay. And the other piece to this is if you fail a fresh transfer, but you were lucky enough to have an excess of embryos frozen to consider using again, automatically you're, you're like have another round in the lottery. Like you have different embryos to try over. So it, this is a statistical thing. It just means by having the extra embryos and you're going to do them in a frozen embryo transfer, you have a greater odds that they're going to be more successful because the first ones didn't work. Of Does course. that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So for some people watching, um, I know you and I are talking about day three versus day five or day six, but I, I'm sure there's some people um, wondering what, what does that mean and why are those numbers important and why don't we talk about day four? So can we touch on that just a bit? You bet. So um, the day of egg retrieval is day zero. And then uh, the day of fertilization check the next day is considered day one. And day three is when we look again at um, embryos and we want to have a sense of how they're growing. So perhaps at you know, retrieval, you 10 eggs, uh, fertilization check, you have eight that have fertilized normally. And on day three, we may say, look, you have six embryos that have divided. Now they have between four and eight cells um, each. And they may all be in different stages. And a patient will say, does that mean I have that many embryos that we're going to freeze or genetically test? And we're like, no, it's too early to tell on day three. So again, if you were trying to do a day three transfer to try and select the best ones, you know, you're left with a, oh, they all kind of look the same. Might We could choose any of these. And, and that's why we tend to put back two versus one blastocyst on day five. Now, uh, as again, as time goes by, we'll look again on day five, so five days from the embryo transfer. And on day five is when we would do an embryo, a fresh embryo transfer. Right. And that mimics uh, the, what happens in the body in the natural system is after ovulation, there is release of progesterone, which helps make changes in the lining of the uterus to make it accept an embryo. And that time is called the window of implantation. And we mimic that at IVF and we, in a fresh embryo transfer, we'll put, put embryos back on day five. Got it. So on that day, we're hoping that we would put back the best embryo and, and that embryo may be slow still. Maybe it is what we call a morula, meaning it's a, a divided clump of cells um, and that it hasn't yet started to cavitate or divide into those different cell lines that make it a blastocyst. And that's okay, like some embryos grow slower than others. And when you look on day five, maybe it's not quite a blastocyst, but you could transfer it. But if you're keeping it in the lab, we would look again on day six. And in our lab, we look again on day seven. Okay. And after day seven, we stop. Um, that's as far as you would go. And what you're looking for when you're checking is to give those embryos that maybe are a bit slower the opportunity to still make it to a stage of blastocyst development. Again, those different cell lines that allow us either perform genetic testing or to allow us to freeze it because blastocysts are much hardier and resistant to the process of cryopreservation. And so we only really want to aim to freeze good embryos. So you have a successful thaw rate on the other side of that. So um, we're looking at really freezing the best blastocyst embryos that make it. And if they don't make it, then those embryos are discarded. Okay. Um, and then are we going to talk about freezing? Yeah. Um, so the actual process of freezing itself. Yeah. I just, I find it super interesting. And I think, and we do see questions about, um, you know, what that is. And patients say they never really actually think about the freezing piece. You yeah. Know that sometimes I never actually thought about what happens in the lab um, yeah. and we don't have to go down. I know that's very complex, but you know, how does something get frozen and then how do you thaw it? 
Yeah, so um, so I, I, let's talk about eggs because that's more like kind of interesting and kind yeah. of topical. Like eggs are frozen um, now with a technology called vitrification. And uh, often places are freezing now sperm and embryos with vitrification also, okay? And in the past technology that was freeze we were using to freeze was called slow freezing. Um, and just a different number of steps involved in that. But when you look at the egg, the egg is the biggest cell in the body, um, obviously as a target so that sperm can find it. And you need a lot of sperm to bind to the outside to digest through and allow that one sperm in. Um, but they're full of fluid. And as a consequence of their fluid content, they're very susceptible to um, damage from ice particles, okay, in freezing. So vitrification or rapid freezing or flash freezing is where you dehydrate the cell and you actually use cryoprotectant to go into that to protect the cellular components from the process of freezing. And the cryoprotectant is actually surrounding the outside of the cell and inside to kind of freeze it in this glass-like state and they're all kind of continuous. And amazingly, upon thawing, where you reverse that process, you're taking out cryoprotectant and you're putting back in the fluid from, to that cell and you have to see them expand from that process, survival rates are really good with vitrification. So you're looking at with eggs, uh, in the past survival rates were not very good using flat, uh, slow freezing, but now success rates are 80 to 90% survival from freezing. Now, I honestly cannot remember the last time that an embryo didn't survive a thaw, like survival rates of blastocysts it's very high, like it's That's amazing. something like 99 plus percent. Um, wow. And again, that signifies to the fact that a blastocyst has many, many cells, like many. So you maybe lose one or two and freezing is fine, but it's more resistant to that process in total, right? Right. And usually freezing is done over the course of the day in different labs at different times by embryologists. And um, every lab would perhaps do it differently. Like there would be different protocols as, as to how they would use, um, uh, maybe some places still are doing, you know, the slow freezing of um, embryos or uh, sperm. But we do see that overall the vitrification process is, is a lot better. That's great. And really assuring, reassuring for patients, knowing, um, you know, that they're, you know, nothing is foolproof so but to hear that 99% of the time it there is a successful thaw, thaw for your embryos that's a like that's a, incredible yeah and again it's every now and then we'll have patients ask us to freeze embryos on day three um, and that's just something that we've kind of moved away from in our lab but we're capable of doing that and we can but survival rates would be different if you were freezing day three embryos um, because again, their, their hardiness has not yet been deemed, okay, a blastocyst declares itself as being better by having made it to day five or six for freezing. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for answering those questions. Yeah, not at all. Um, so I'm wondering if we want to talk a little bit about like age limits. To yes, that because would be, that would be great. So most clinics in Canada have a cutoff of the age of like 43 um, for a, a woman using her own eggs um, at IVF. Um, at our clinic, again, it would be after an individualized assessment and counseling as to whether or not they would want to do that, but up to the age of 45. Okay. okay. Um, after the age of 45, we're looking at recommending donor um, eggs for use. And again, that comes from the fact that younger eggs are genetic, lead to embryos that are genetically more sound and have a higher chance of pregnancy. And so um, we see pregnancy rates, say of a 48-year-old who has a uterus and wants to use a donor egg uh, to create an embryo with either partner sperm or donor sperm. And they have an embryo that is going to be transferred. Their chance of pregnancy is the same for anybody that is using that aged egg. It doesn't matter oh. how old the age of the uterus is, it is deemed by the age of the egg. And most donors come um, under the age of 35. 
Right. Okay. And is, does menopause, I, I assume you would take menopause into consideration. So, um, or, not really. No, so okay. We see 1% of women under the age of 40 going into premature ovarian insufficiency or failure in menopause early than, earlier than expected. Yeah. And uh, these women have no periods. That's what menopause is. Cessation of menses is a uh, consequence of the loss of eggs. Um, but their chance of pregnancy is exactly the same as anyone else using a donor egg. So wow. that isn't to say that every donor egg leads to an embryo that brings about a pregnancy, but the statistical odds is pretty good. So you're looking at like 65 to 70% with a single embryo. Wow. Um, and so what menopause means is your body just is appropriately not signaling or capable to make an egg grow because the eggs are all gone. And as a consequence of that, then you're, you don't have hormonal estrogen circulating to thicken a lining and you don't have ovulation to bring about a withdrawal bleed. So okay. we, can, we can exogenously, so for, from the outside, give patients medications that mimic all of that. And still, if you have a uterus in place, we can, the uterus responds to those signals. Wow. And so estrogen makes a, a lining thick. And at the right time, then you can determine whether its thickness is appropriate by ultrasound. And we give progesterone to time when to do an embryo transfer. Wow, that's really interesting. Thank you yeah. for clarifying that. So I did want to mention, because of Pride Month, I thought we should talk a little bit about the LGBTQ community. Yes, please. That would be amazing. So um, let's start with a scenario, say, of um, a gay man who wants to conceive as a single parent. Mm -hmm. So um, he may have sperm, and then we could use that sperm to create an embryo, but he needs a donor egg, and he would need a carrier, a gestational carrier or surrogate um, to bring about pregnancy. So donor eggs, I guess we didn't address this, where do they come from? So in Canada, the law states that you um, can't pay or coerce a donor into the process of uh, doing IVF. You can ask someone close to you if they would be a donor for you, and you can cover the cost of their treatment. And we do recommend that uh, reproductive counseling is undergone by all participants. So um, the intended parent is the person that is going to take home the child. Mm -hmm. And the donor being the person that goes through the treatment to then give eggs or sperm towards the process. And it's important that all parties have a legal contract in place um, to safeguard everybody's well-being in this, as well as uh, the offspring. Um, in I would say the vast majority of donor eggs come from anonymous sources and um, often that's through the US because their laws are different. So they do have clinics that can um, put through donors who are young after screening and when they've uh, been deemed appropriate, they do an IVF cycle and either their eggs are frozen and you can buy frozen eggs that are shipped here for thawing and then fertilization here in our lab or you could go there and have a fresh donor, like meaning if their eggs are not frozen and you provide your sample there to create an embryo in real time, okay, in their lab. And then maybe you freeze embryos and, and um, decide when to use them into a carrier in this context of um, a single gay man who wants to be a parent, okay. Um, in terms of surrogacy and getting a gestational carrier, you know, in Canada, it is a little bit more difficult than in the States. Um, but we, we work with agencies um, and, and ask our patients to contact agencies that help with, um, you know, ac accessing surrogates for patients um, in an appropriate way. And again, there needs to be legal contracts and um, counseling done in that scenario. Um, and the costs increase significantly when you're looking at using a surrogate as well. Um, in terms of, should we move on to a different scenario? Yeah, let's do, um, let's talk maybe about a lesbian couple. Yeah, so often I'm envious at their options because they have four ovaries and two uteruses to consider. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if there is one, one that maybe isn't as good prognosis at the other, they have other options, I, you know. So um, if 
a partner feels strongly about um, conceiving and carrying, um, again, they go through the normal evaluation. We want to make sure their fallopian tubes are open. They could access donor sperm, um, either anonymous or known now, and have an insemination. So where we just place sperm inside the uterus at the right time and allow them to swim to uh, the egg through the tube. And we want to do that in a well-timed way. And their odds of pregnancy in that month is dictated by their age. And at best, it's really 20, 25% for a young woman. Um, and then with time, that kind of goes down, that odds goes down. Um, an alternative is egg sharing, which I think is pretty special in that maybe one partner wants to contribute their eggs to making embryos with using donor sperm, and then their partner is actually going to carry that pregnancy. Yeah, that's well, that special. egg sharing IVF, which is really lovely, yeah. Um, and we see different permutations of, of that. Um, maybe you have a, a lesbian couple, but one is gender diverse and actually has sperm mm -hmm. to contribute to the, the scenario. Um, and so maybe you're looking at using their sperm for an insemination um, in that situation. So, um, you know, you need all the, the permutations to work out what would be best for an individual couple. Great. And so for members of the LGBTQ community, um, if they want to move forward with their family building, um, is it best for them to go directly to a fertility clinic? Where do they start? Yeah. I think it makes sense to get an evaluation at the beginning because none of us ever really know um, much about our reproductive health without really looking, you know, and so um, you can be born with one fallopian tube. It's not very common, but it's possible, you know, you can um, have things such as polyps, which is just a benign growth in the uterus that could maybe decrease the likelihood of a home insemination working. So you might want to know and have an evaluation up front and have an idea of what your options are. And then looking at the individual aspects of like age or egg reserve and then, you know, putting those pieces together. I am um, a big proponent of, you know, uh, younger people being aware of what their options are. Like I failed IVF at 38, being um, someone who had lost their eggs at that point in time. And I really feel that if fertility is important to you and you want to maximize the chance of success, you need to look at this stuff earlier. And really now that egg freezing is a viable option and you have the opportunity for intervening sooner than later, people wanna know so that they can act upon those pieces. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I guess the other side of that is that if you're young and you, know, you don't have any reproductive health issues, you know, is there a harm to doing a few months of home inseminations? You know, you can buy a home insemination kit. I don't think they're, is other than you'd really want to know that your donor didn't have STIs. You know, you might want to ask them to have screening done with their GP um, and also maybe a semen analysis to make sure you're not wasting your time and that it's a reasonable uh, sperm donor to consider. And, and we really recommend strongly legal contracts even in this scenario. Absolutely. absolutely. At yeah. least meeting with a lawyer to discuss um, options so you feel informed about the decisions that you're making. Absolutely. Um, and we work with fertility lawyers across this country. So if any of you watching um, either live or on the, the replay of this video, uh, please connect with us and we're happy to um, tell you about our partner uh, lawyers who work specifically with fertility to help you um, make some of those decisions. Um, I think, do we have any, I feel like we might be missing one. Oh, a known and, and anonymous donors. I just wanted to touch on that. Um, I'd love for you to talk just a bit about those things. So um, in terms of sperm, shall we say, uh, anonymous yeah. or known, um, uh, you know, their regulations have just changed on um, clinics being able to screen and facilitate using known, well, appropriate known donors. Okay, mm -hmm. so last year before um, we were looking at guidelines from Health Canada whereby we would be able to access donor sperm through distributors in Canada and those distributors had taken over the role of screening donors and um, 
ensuring that they had gone through quarantine in the appropriate way prior to distributing sperm. Now, um, clinics, we're not distributors, we're not going about shipping sperm from one place to another, but we can, if a couple present with a known donor, we can help with the process of screening that known donor um, in terms of checking the semen analysis, infectious disease screening, which needs to take place over discrete periods of time to ensure that there isn't a window with which we're missing infection. And then um, we would look at them facilitating insemination with that um, donor. Um, it's a process as well. There's some pieces that need to go into place. And we are, as a clinic, looking for, um, you know, again, we're hoping that patients will have legal contracts in place for this. Um, I think, you know, the issue to date has been access to samples because of the way the law is, you know, stating that you can't remunerate a donor. And so most of the donor samples through distributing centers have come from the state. Um, and so, and it's, I guess, um, in short supply. And so as a consequence, it's expensive. Like you're looking yeah. at, you know, anywhere from 800 to $1,200 for a single vial of sperm. And then with a thaw and insemination, like you're not far off $2,000 for one chance at an insemination. And I can see why young couples um, or, or persons who are using donor sperm to get pregnant will often look at, you know, if they want more than one child, IVF with a single vial of sperm to bring them the greater odds of many embryos and maybe many children. Now, that's very aggressive, but I can see how the cost piece comes into this for patients and they try to determine how best to divvy that up or else they're really looking at trial and error with insemination to see how um, the chips fall. Absolutely. And then, then if you have to go through several inseminations, that costs a $2,000. Um, you can you know, do it even do... more than IVF, you know. And Absolutely. I, I guess I started this by saying, um, you know, infertility for a young person is 12 months of exposure to sperm. I wouldn't recommend ever 12 months of insemination without like significant counseling around, you know, the odds and what the alternatives were. And often we're looking at fertility boosting before then with fertility pills. Usually, usually my, most of us practice this way, three or four months of exposures to sperm, see how you do without anything else. And if you're not having success, then we reevaluate where you go. That's great. That's really good advice. We also see those questions in our, um, in our, in our online support groups and people are saying, you know, I'm going in for my fifth IUI at, and they're getting a little bit at this point um, nervous or they're questioning, you know, do we have to move on to IVF um, if that, or could that be an option? And they're always, there seems to be lots of um, people looking for advice in, when they're in those situations. So that's really good information for people. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we've just got a few minutes left. Uh, do you have anything you wanted to touch on that you think would be important before? I think we've covered really big picture stuff other than ICSI, I guess, intracytoplasmic sperm injection as a form of fertilization. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just taking a single sperm? And injecting it directly into an egg as opposed to putting a droplet of sperm around a single egg and letting them do their own thing. The clearest indication for ICSI is um, sperm that's surgically being retrieved where there's a high likelihood that's not moving fast. Mm -hmm. So you have to inject that in or um, very low numbers of sperm, um, either parameters of concentration and motility not looking so good, uh, then you would inject a sperm the egg. Also, if you're using frozen eggs, either from a donor or one's own self, you do need to inject a sperm into a, a previously frozen egg. So for the vitrification process, they actually have to strip the eggs of the binding sites for sperm. So that's a requirement oh, okay. in that situation. Okay. Yeah. And that's an additional piece of the puzzle. Yeah. When you got it. If someone Great. has had failed or very poor fertilization rates in the past, we would look at doing ICSI as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you find that, um, and this is maybe in general, do, do most clinics recommend that 
because it's more ICSI is more successful at fertilization? I don't know the answer. No, or... I don't. I, I don't think that's the case. I think uh, the clearest indication is what I've listed, but I, I think we'll often say to patients, especially with unexplained infertility, like, listen, we don't know why you're not getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell my patients the likelihood of failed fertilization is less than 5%. That's not very comforting knowing the costs that go into IVF here in BC where it's not mm -hmm. covered and the amount of time and effort that goes into treatment cycle. And I see more patients opting for it to cover their basis, right? Yes. Now we do quote a 1% to 2% increased risk of birth defects associated with ICSI. Um, I think that's interesting. There's like surveys that are going on in Canada asking health professionals like myself, you know, do you believe that this is real? I, I mean, there's studies that have shown this where the population of people were men who had male factor infertility and you were clearly bypassing something that was preventing them from getting pregnant on their own. If you look at the data from women who frozen their eggs and thawed them and then have to fertilize with ICSI, there is no increased risk in birth defects. So I do think it relates to the population of people that you're applying the ICSI to. Um, but again, it's full disclosure. Like you give that to patients and you Absolutely. let them choose what they want to do. And I can guarantee you if, if it doesn't work out very well and you haven't had that discussion, it's it's not very comfortable. Like I think patients need to be aware of that as a potential option for them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And patients, we, you know, it's really important, I think, to give them all of the information that they need so that they can make an educated decision. It, it empowers them to, to say, I'm comfortable making this decision. Yes, I'm going to do this. No, we're not going to do this. Um, and that's what at Fertility Matters Canada, that's why we have these conversations with experts like you to bring this information to patients and they may have heard it in a doc, in a tele, in a telemedicine conference or they may have sat down with a physician more and you know more than one time um, but but these these discussions are really important to help solidify um, mm -hmm. these processes and the information so patients feel really comfortable about this really un unnerving, uh, unpredictable time um, when they're struggling with fertility. Yeah. Great. Well, Dr. Talon, thank you. This was very informative. I've learned several things and I've been um, not a, I've been working in this industry plus a patient uh, for several years. So um, thank you for educating me and for educating everybody who's watching. Um, we will share this broadcast uh, on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel within a couple of days. Um, and we'll be really um, looking forward to working with you again and your team at All of Fertility in Vancouver uh, in the coming months. I know we've got a couple of other things in the works with your team. Uh, the next webcast with someone from All of is on June 18th. We've got a webinar uh, about COVID with Dr. Jason Hickary and Dr. Marjorie Dixon from Innova Fertility in Toronto. So we're really excited about that. Dr. Talent, enjoy your weekend and we will. Thank you. Um, you too. We will be in touch. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in live with us today. All the best. Thanks, Carolyn. Bye. Bye.